Nice to see so many friendly faces out here. Um, my name is John Marshall, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as president here at Colorado Mesa University. And I'd like to take this moment to welcome all of you here in person, as well as all of our friends that are watching over Facebook Live stream. Tonight we get to have some, uh, what, a moment to enjoy the way things ought to be, which is civil discourse among thinking friends and neighbors who see the world differently. And, and how we pursue that conversation matters. And so at CMU, we're so glad to, to be able to host the Steamboat Institute, uh, our esteemed panelists, which I think I just had a chance to meet, and um, some really remarkable individuals that we all get to hear from tonight. So um, with that, I'd like to take a moment and introduce Jennifer Schubert Aiken. Jennifer's a, a longtime friend and a Coloradan. She hails from Steamboat Springs, and she's here on behalf of the Steamboat Institute. If you would, help me welcome Jennifer Schubert Aiken with the Steamboat Institute. And, and, and Jennifer, I need to also say thank you to um, not just the Steamboat Institute, but the Bill and May Robinson uh, Endowment for helping with this guest speaking appearance. And we're so glad that you get to be here in this facility to represent the honor of, of Bill and May Robinson and to honor CMU with this conversation. Thank you, Jennifer, and welcome. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. It's great to be back in beautiful Grand Junction. I live in Steamboat Springs, and I've started coming down here a lot and just love free Mesa County and uh, Colorado Mesa University. So thank you, President Marshall, for that warm welcome and for hosting us here tonight on the CMU campus. We really appreciate having the opportunity to collaborate with the CMU Civic Forum. And uh, it's always a pleasure to, to come out to Grand Junction and have an excuse to be out here in this beautiful area. We welcome our audience here at Colorado Mesa University, as well as many more who are watching tonight. The live stream that we have on uh, steamboatinstitute.org there are people watching on campuses and communities from across America, so we welcome them as well. Tonight's debate will ask an important question. Is the social justice movement of today the new civil rights movement? We invite all of our audience members, both those of you who are here in person as well as those watching the live stream, to please answer this poll question now if you haven't already. Before the debate begins, there was a link that was sent to you by text and or email. There are also QR codes that you see on the code, uh, on the seats here in the auditorium, as well as those watching uh, the live stream. You can click on a link to submit your question so it can be answered live on stage by our debaters tonight. But before we begin this evening's debate, I would like to tell you about Steamboat Institute's upcoming Campus Liberty Tour debates. On October 26th and 27th, we will host two debates, at the, one at the University of Texas at Austin and one at the University of Maryland in College Park on the topic of which road will lead to prosperity and achieving your dreams. Is it government programs or free enterprise? Our debaters will be Charles Payne, host of Making Money with Charles Payne on the Fox Business Network, and Bakari Sellers, who is a CNN political analyst. Both of these debates will also uh, be live streamed. They are free and open to the public. If uh, you have friends or family in Austin or College Park, uh, for those of you uh, watching the live stream, we would love to have you uh, August, October 26th and 27th, UT Austin and University of Maryland. You can find registration details and other details at steamboatinstitute.org. We're also planning a full schedule of Campus Liberty Tour debates for 2022 on campuses all over the country, including here in Colorado. So please follow Steamboat Institute on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn to get the latest updates. You might also want to sign up for our email list at steamboatinstitute.org. Steamboat Institute's Campus Liberty Tour debates are gaining in popularity and importance because of the increasing threat posed by cancel culture. While cancel culture seems to be taking over, Steamboat Institute takes the opposite approach. We encourage free and robust debate on even the most contentious issues. This is how students, and all of us really, develop critical thinking skills and avoid falling into the trap of living in echo chambers. 
Our emphasis is on teaching students and all who attend our debates how to think, not what to think. One of my favorite quotes is from John Stuart Mill, which is, he who knows only his own side of things knows little of that. Steamboat Institute is a 501c3 nonprofit, nonpartisan organization which promotes America's founding principles and inspires people to defend liberty. Our debates and other programs are made possible by the generous support of many individuals and foundations. Um, I would just like to thank the following major sponsors of our Campus Liberty Tour debates. They are the Robert and Judy Newman Family Foundation, Gary Cooper of Cooper Steel in Nashville, the Woodford Foundation for Limited Government, the Hatton Sumners Foundation in Dallas, the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation, the Anschutz Foundation, Adolph Coors Foundation, Jack Roth Charitable Foundation, the Snyder Foundation, and the Strake Foundation. I would also like to thank our media partner, Media DC, which publishes the Washington Examiner, Ross Kaminsky, who is host of the Ross Kaminsky Show on KOA News Radio, and the Grand Junction Daily Sentinel for helping to promote this week's debates. We also held the debate in Denver last evening. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers and moderator for this evening. Richard Fowler is the nationally syndicated radio host of The Richard Fowler Show. He is a Fox News Channel contributor, a millennial messaging expert, and also a contributor for Forbes magazine. Richard is also a senior fellow at the New Leaders Council, a nonprofit organization that works to recruit, train, and promote young progressive leaders. Richard focuses on humanizing policy issues across the intersection of race, class, and gender. His work has included uncovering the deplorable conditions in the De Detroit public school system, as well as training and equipping hundreds of millennials to run for office and take charge of their community. When asked what drives him, Richard says, talk is cheap, our country needs real solutions, and they will come from our greatest resource, our people. Richard is a graduate of George Washington University, and we're delighted to have him here with us this evening. So welcome, Richard Fowler. Jason Riley is a columnist and editorial board member for the Wall Street Journal, where he began his career in 1994. His popular weekly column, Upward Mobility, has run since 2016. Jason is also a fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a Fox News commentator. Jason was the 2018 recipient of the prestigious Bradley Prize and is the author of several books, including his most recent, Maverick, a name you all should love, Maverick, a biography of Thomas Sowell. A native of Buffalo, New York, Jason is a graduate of the State University of New York at Buffalo. We are also proud that Jason is a member of Steamboat Institute's emerging, or I'm sorry, Steamboat Institute's Campus Liberty Tour Advisory Board. Welcome, Jason Riley. Our moderator this evening is Philip Wegman. Philip is White House correspondent for Real Clear Politics, and in this role, he can frequently be found in the White House press briefing room giving Jen Psaki a hard time. He previously wrote for the Washington Examiner and has done investigative reporting on congressional corruption and institutional malfeasance. In 2018, we were very proud to select Phil as the recipient of Steamboat Institute's Tony Blankley Fellowship for Public Policy and American Exceptionalism, which is awarded annually to a rising young journalist who embodies the principles of the Steamboat Institute. Phil can be seen regularly on CNN, Fox, and Fox Business, and his voice has also been heard on the BBC, NPR, and numerous other radio outlets. Phil is a graduate of Hillsdale College with degrees in history and politics. He's also a motorcycle enthusiast, and I have encouraged him to come back to Grand Junction when he can stay for more than one night to ride his bike through the Colorado National Monument. Um, and now I will turn it over to our moderator, Philip Wegman, for what is sure to be an intriguing debate this evening. Welcome. Well, thank you, Jennifer, for that lovely introduction. Thank you to the Steamboat Institute for organizing this debate. Thank you to the university for hosting us this evening. Thank you to you, the audience, for being here in person. And then also, I understand that we have a number of folks watching from home right now tuning in to this debate. 
And that concludes the thank yous and introductions. Um, there's no reason for either of our interlocutors to dawdle with niceties. We expect a robust exchange of ideas. I know the audience expects that, and I know that our debaters are prepared to deliver. Um, also, while I expect a polite discussion, and I imagine that there are even areas where the two of you uh, certainly uh, might agree, you'll notice that I've emphasized that this is a debate. And this evening, my only allegiance is to the clock. So gentlemen, please keep your answers concise and know that if you run long or if you run off topic, as the moderator, I will do my best to steer you back on course and back on track. And uh, finally, to you, our lovely audience, uh, let me explain your role here this evening. You are not passive observers. You are, in fact, the judges. Um, and we have asked you to weigh the motion, which our debaters are going to be discussing this evening, which is, do you think the social justice movement is the new civil rights movement? And I already know what a lot of you think, because conveniently enough, you did a little bit of polling beforehand. So let me pull up here what the initial polling shows. On the question, the motion before us, do you think that social justice movement is the new civil rights movement? 46% of you say yes. 37% of you say no. And 17% are unsure. We will poll you after the debate and the winner of the exchange will be the one who has moved the most percentage in, the, in their direction. Uh, so there will be a chance for you to you know, register your opinion once again. There's also an opportunity for you to ask questions uh, in case I'm not doing a good enough job. So feel free to send questions either through the email that you registered with or through text message. And um, I believe that uh, th there might also be a QWERTY code, but a lot of you are, are millennials and I'm sure you can figure that out. Um, so. Again, the motion for tonight that I'm going to keep both of our debaters rigorously focused on is do you think the social justice movement is the new civil rights movement? And Richard, I'll defer to you to argue the affirmative at first. Sure. Good night, everybody. How are y'all doing? I, I can't hear. How are y'all doing? Well, it's good to be in Grand Junction. I must say this is my first time here. Um, it probably won't be my last. You guys have a very beautiful landscape. I, I want to first thank Jennifer of the Steamboat Institute for having me here, and I also want to thank uh, your, new, your new president of, this, uh, of the Colorado Mesa University, John Marshall, for a warm welcome um, and a great hospitality. So when, forced with, when pondering this question of whether or not the current social justice movement is the new civil rights movement, I uh, went back a little bit to say, well, what is America, right? Because this is the, this is the constant fight, because the civil rights movement is, was trying to help define what America was. So for me, I think America is like a really good pot of chicken soup. Um, and if you really think about this pandemic and what we've been through over the past 12 months, chicken soup has become more and more and more a staple of our lives. Not only is it a comfort food, but it also helps you uh, when you're dealing with a cold. But here's the, th here's the thing about a good chicken soup. A chicken soup is made up of a lot of different ingredients, right? On their own, they're very tasty, but when cooked together to perfection, they're even better, right? You have all the different ingredients. Just think about it. You have potatoes, carrots, chickens, onions, cilantro, if you're nasty, some salt and pepper, pumpkin, all the different things that make up a good chicken soup. They all have their different identities. They all come from different parts. They're grown in different areas. But when put together, they make a perfect chicken soup. And that really is the definition of America. A whole bunch of people from different walks of life coming together to form a more perfect union. Beyond being a commentator on cable news, I'm also a storyteller. Uh, and, and as a storyteller, your job is to put your assumptions aside and to see the world from somebody else's viewpoint. So I have spent 24 hours with a cop on the night shift. And I've asked the tough questions. I've also spent two weeks with workers in West Virginia. I spent a year with educators in Detroit trying to understand what is their, what is their lived experience? What's different in their ingredients than mine? What makes their lived experiences different? What, what makes us all uniquely American? Each of us come from different walks of life. 
We have different lived experiences. We've conquered different barriers. We come from different communities. And we all have different needs. Sadly, in, our Amer in American politics, that nuance is often missed, right? In our daily walk of life, it's often missed. All our different walks of life make us who we are. And so while they say tonight's a debate, I truly believe it's actually a discussion. Because what's happening in Washington is a whole bunch of debating and not a lot of solutions. You have one person on this side yelling, another person on that side yelling, and we at home are wondering, well, when are we going to get to the solutions? And the solutions exist when people from all walks of life come to the table and actually begin to have a conversation. A good friend of mine used to say, it's usually those closest to the problem that are those that are the ones that are closest to the solution. And oftentimes, the ones who are crafting the solutions in America are way too far away from the problems. And the people who are close to the problems rarely ever have a seat at the table. So when I think about our civil rights movement, or our social justice movement today, it's really a cry to increase the amount of seats that we have at the table so we can have a true policy discussion on how we make this country a more perfect union. So hopefully, when this debate's over, or rather this discussion, we will be able to see America from a new light and not the easy lines that politicians have defined us by. Democrat versus Republican, red versus blue, black versus white. These definitions are so easy and they're fatalistic, right? And, there's more, and they make it seem that there's more that divides us and actually unites us. But the truth of the matter is, it's actually the opposite. So when we leave here tonight, I want you to ask yourself three questions. When you hear somebody bring up an issue that's happening in their community. One, why do they feel this way? How do they come to that conclusion? And can you see the world from their eyes with no pretenses or no prejudgments? Oftentimes in our politics, it's filled with way too much prejudgments and way too much pretense. So I hope you will engage us in what will be an amazing discussion about how we put the assumptions aside, how we put the pretenses aside, how we put the prejudgments aside, and actually have real conversations and look each other in the eye. Now I will warn you that these conversations might be tough. They might be difficult. They might be emotional. And they might not be conversations that you want to have. But if we make the choice to have them, we'll actually make this country a lot better. Thank you so much for being here tonight, and I look forward to a great conversation. Well, I want to extend my thanks to the uh, university for hosting us and to the Steamboat Institute for putting this together. Um, I think that the social justice movement today is uh, quite different in some fundamental ways from the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. And I'll use a, a personal anecdote to sort of illustrate um, just how fundamental, how fundamentally different I think they, they are. Um, a few years ago I wrote a column for the Wall Street Journal on the prevalence of violent crime in poor black neighborhoods. And in the column, I used to quote from Martin Luther King, who once told a black congregation, do you know that Negroes are 10% of the population in St. Louis and responsible for 58% of the crimes? He said, we've got to face that. We've got to do something about our moral standards. He said, we know that there are many things wrong in the white world but there are many things wrong in the black world too. We can't keep on blaming the white man. There are things we must do for ourselves. Now, after the column ran, a number of readers contacted the paper and accused me of making up the quotes, which come from a 1961 profile of King written by the famous black author James Baldwin in Harper's Magazine. I was a little surprised at this reaction because you know, these days all you have to do is Google a quote and find the source. But what really struck me about the reaction is that the people who accused me of making up the quote apparently just couldn't believe that the nation's most prominent civil rights leaders 
used to speak this way about problems in the black community and the role of personal responsibility. Now, King was obviously a uniquely gifted and capable leader. And I'm not suggesting that black people today need another Martin Luther King. They don't. What I'm suggesting is that King represented a type of leadership, a type of thinking, a good faith approach to closing racial divisions that politicians and social activists today barely even give lip service to. King and his generation of leaders, people like Thurgood Marshall and Roy Wilkins, who was the head of the NAACP in those crucial decades of the 50s and 60s, they believed that whites obviously had a role to play in changing a fundamentally racist system. But they also understood that blacks had a role to play. And they were willing to hold blacks accountable, despite the white racism, the legal and rampant white racism that existed at the time. They operated under the belief and tried to instill in young people the belief that blacks must succeed notwithstanding these racial barriers, that blacks can't sit around waiting for whites to get their act together first, that there was no time for that. So contrast that perspective, that approach, with the activists and politicians today who spend much more time making excuses for the kind of antisocial behavior that prominent black leaders of the King era would regularly condemn. This contemporary leadership doesn't really want to discuss black behavior. They want to discuss white behavior. The assumption is that black behavior is almost irrelevant because after all, racism still exists in America. So they send young black kids out into the world with a chip on their shoulder. They tell them the cops are gunning for them, that their teachers are racist, the tests are racist, the employers are racist, the judges and the prosecutors and the entire judicial system is stacked against them. And they tell them that the world owes them and that if they don't succeed, it's not really their fault. So at a time when young blacks today are much more likely to experience racial preferences than racial slights, at a time when you have a generation of blacks who came of age with a twice elected black president, we have people in positions of influence and authority insisting that blacks can't be held in any way responsible for these persistent racial gaps until white racism has been essentially vanquished from America. In many cases, you're dealing with black leaders and activists who consider any focus on black responsibility or accountability to be itself a form of racism. And you're dealing with an academic and political and media establishment that, for the most part, takes this point of view. That's the big difference, in my view, between social activists today and the civil rights leaders in the 1950s and 60s. I'll stop there, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Well, Jason, you mentioned um, the uh, former president, so I think that's a good place to start as we are getting our bearing here. Uh, former President Barack Obama made this observation recently. He said this summer that the debates over race in America are, quote, powerful because they get at what story we tell about ourselves. So uh, let's talk about the story and let's be precise in our definitions. My question to both of you is, what is today's definition of social justice and would the leaders of yesterday's civil rights movement accept today's definition? Richard, we'll start with you. And again, uh, please keep your, your answers to about four or five minutes. Well, I think today's definition of social justice is about, like I said in my opening remarks, is ensuring that everybody that's part of this more perfect union has a seat at the table. Uh, and I think that has been, that's the fight, right? And I think every time you've seen the push, right? There's been pressure on the system. It's been to say we need more seats at the table. So when you think about the Civil Rights Act and you think about the pushes that was made by Martin Luther King and Thurgood Marshall, as Jason mentioned, it was because they wanted more representation at the table, 
right? Then you have the Stonewall Riots, which happened in New York with the LGBTQ community of color. And it was more seats at the table. And so what we've got to constantly do in this country, if we're truly to be a melting pot, it has to be as we become more diverse as a nation, how do we ensure that there are more seats at the table and everybody is actually living out the true form of the Constitution which says that you have the ability to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's what the fight's always been about. That's why people, are in, people take to the streets and they protest because when your ability to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is infringed upon, then you express your First Amendment and say, I want to make sure that I have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Right, so just a quick follow up here, then it seems that when you were discussing um, today's social justice movement, you see this as a continuation, not a differentiation of the earlier civil rights movement. Of course, and I think that sadly, we're still having the same fight. When we're having a fight about ensuring that people have the right to vote in parts of the country, and you see governors passing laws that make it harder for people to vote, and when what we should be doing in this country, after we had an election that had the greatest turnout in American history, we should be saying, well, what do we do in this election to ensure that we got more Americans than ever to vote? How do we take some of the things in this election and ensure at the next election we have more Americans than ever to vote? Jason, same question to you in terms of uh, today's definition of social justice. And uh, the question here is sort of, would the leaders of yesterday's civil rights movement be comfortable with today's definition of social justice? Well, I think different people define social justice differently. Um, so I don't think there is an official definition, but I think broadly speaking, what social justice activists are interested in are results. Um, and that differs from traditional notions of justice which were focused more on opportunities. Um, uh, if uh, two sports teams are playing and the officials are calling the game fairly, um, treating both sides equally, and one team wins 5-0, it's considered a just outcome, even though one team lost. Um, social justice activists today are, are, are fighting for something that I think the previous generation of civil rights leaders uh, we're not fighting for. It may have been something they hoped to achieve, but that was not the fundamental fight. It was for uh, equal treatment in the first place, traditional forms of justice. Um, Richard said we're still fighting this, these fights, and mentioned voting rights as an example. Um, I think that's an example of um, a battle that has been fought and won pretty decisively. Um, we're not fighting for, for, for uh, fundamental rights like voting today. For example, um, black voter turnout began to increase uh, quite dramatically during the Clinton administration back in the uh, mid-90s. Um, by 2008, black tur voter turnout in the election was higher than white voter turnout. Um, in 2012, black voter turnout was once again higher than white voter turnout. In 2016, it dipped some, but only back to the pre-Obama level. In 2018, uh, voter turnout for all minority groups reached record highs for a midterm election. And in 2020, voter turnout for Asians and Hispanics reached record highs. And for blacks, it was the third highest after 2008 and 2012. If voter suppression is taking place in this country, where is the evidence? So that is a fake fight that is going on. That is a fight going on to encourage, to scare people, to make them paranoid, try and get them out to the polls. But the actual evidence of turnout on election day is not supported, does not support the notion that voter suppression is taking place in this country. Uh, Richard, I'd like to get your response, and if you would um, respond to this question of voter turnout, and is there a particularly egregious example in any of the state laws or any of the corrective measures that some of these state legislatures have taken that, you, that would, um, you know, sure. dispute what, what sure. Jason is so saying here? Jason opened up this conversation talking about results, right? And so when you, if you're quoting voter turnout numbers and you're having a conversation of results, 
I'm having a conversation about opportunity. And so when you're talking about in the state of Georgia, in black counties like Fulton County and Gwinnett County and DeKalb County, when voters are standing in line in those neighborhoods for two, three, four, five hours to vote, or, or in the case of the midterms where you literally, literally had to take Jesse Jackson going to a poll because there was one machine that worked because they couldn't find the plugs for the other machines. Or better yet, in the state of Texas, where this new law that is put, that, that's currently being put in place, after you had record turnout, as Jason just pointed to, is now making it harder for people to vote, right? This, not, this shouldn't be the conversation that we're having. When you know that people are working harder, people are working multiple jobs, we should be doing everything in our power to make more and more Americans engage in our democracy. For this democracy, or better yet, this republic to work, it requires that more of us are part of it. So we shouldn't be having a conversation about restrictive laws. What we should be having a conversation about is how do we make Election Day a holiday? so that every American has the ability to cast their vote without worrying about, well, am I going to get time off from work to do it? Am I going to lose my job if I decide to go and vote? We've got to make it in this country, if we really want to have a representative democracy, we've got to make sure it doesn't even matter what race you are, how young you are, how old you are. We've got to make sure that people have a chance to vote. And when you have individuals saying, well, we're going to pass laws that make it harder for folks to vote, we're going to pass laws that say, the League of Conservation Voters can't hand out water when folks are waiting in line for three or four hours to vote. To me, that seems that you are literally trying to take away people's opportunity to have their voices heard in this democracy. So th this is a wide-ranging debate, but I do want to get uh, Jason's response. Again, um, where, where is the evidence? I just pointed to it. We Gwinnett County, record, Bolton County, DeKalb County. We have record. We can also talk about voter purges. We have <laughs> record voter turnout in this country in recent elections. If people can't get to the polls, how can we have record voter turnout? Now, secondly, I thought Georgia might come up, so I actually looked up a little data on voting in Georgia. And let me go back and explain what real voter suppression looked like. In 1964, the year before the Voting Rights Act passed, voter registration in Mississippi was 6%. Black voter registration in Mississippi was 6%, the lowest of anywhere in the South. In 1966, just one year after the Voting Rights Act passed, voter registration in Mississippi climbed from 6% to 60%. And Mississippi was no outlier. Alabama, Georgia, all experienced these record leaps. Today, black voter registration in the South is higher than it is in other regions of the country. In places like Tennessee and Mississippi, it's higher than it is among white voters. In 2014 in Georgia, Black voter registration was 62%. It climbed to 68% in 2020, rose six points. Among whites, it went from 65% to 66%. It rose one point. Voter registration in Georgia in 2018 was higher among blacks than among whites. In 2018, that was the year that Stacey Abrams started her organization to fight, fight voter uh, suppression. When she started this organization, black voter registration in Georgia was already higher than white voter registration and had been climbing at a faster pace. She started an organization in search of a problem that didn't exist. Again, the results speak for themselves. And by the way, these so laws. So you don't have a problem with these, people just waiting. Just one last point. You don't these have a problem laws, with people waiting four point. hours to vote in black communities. This one last point. Or people having the one point machine is, to vote. They're in turning black out in record numbers. Or you have a, you don't have a problem with the League of Conservation Voters not being able to hand out water. You don't have a problem with that. These, these, these issues don't bother you. My point is that it is not <laughs> impeding anyone's ability to vote because, because we have so, record voter so wait turnout. A minute. Despite the fact that black women are organizing in these communities and they're getting their voters out, that doesn't, it doesn't dispute the fact that the laws are stacked against them. 
I'm talking about the results. Yes, because the results are black women and black people in these communities what are would voter, organizing. What, so, so, so if, if, if blacks are turning out at lower they're rates. They're turning out despite the fact that the right, laws are stacked right, against right. them. So by your logic, if blacks turn out at lower rates, it's voter suppression. No, the voter suppression is happening, rates, but we're organizing despite that. Gentlemen, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. This is a broad topic. It's a, it's a heads I win, lose you tail argument. No, so, no, because so whether, so voters, gentlemen, whether, gentlemen, whether, whether whether because black voter registration goes up or down, it's still suppression. Gentlemen, uh, I, I don't think we're going to find any agreement on this topic here. Uh, you both have made your, your case very powerfully, so we are going to move on to other discussions here. Um, and we could spend an entire debate on that topic alone, but we have a lot of ground to cover. So um, I wanted to ask, though, it, you know, famously, MLK points to the Constitution and the Declaration as a promise that all men would be guaranteed the unalienable right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He added in 1963 that America has defaulted on this promissory note. I would like both of you to do a credit check uh, on the country. Have we advanced or regressed in realizing the potential of that note? And then back to the motion tonight. Uh, is the new social justice movement needed to advance the work of the civil rights movement? So Jason, we'll, we'll start with you. Well, I think we've made tremendous progress. I think we were just talking about that progress in terms of voting rights, but also in terms of income levels, in terms of, uh, of, 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 of anti-discrimination efforts in this country. If you look at uh, polling on, 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 on uh, integration, whether it's neighborhoods, whether it's workplaces, whether it's schools, whether it's marriages, we, we have made tremendous progress in this country. I, 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 I think King would be uh, both pleased and surprised by how much progress we've made. We've had a twice elected black president. The current vice president is black. We've had uh, blacks running the largest cities in this country, from Los Angeles and New York to Chicago and Washington and Philadelphia and Cleveland. This, this would have been unheard of um, uh, back in the 1940s and 50s and the early days of the civil rights movement. We have had black joint chiefs of staff and secretaries of state and black school chiefs and fire chiefs. And uh, we, we have made a tremendous amount of progress. There is more opportunity in this country today than ever before for all groups. Um, the question is whether people are taking advantage of that opportunity. But does the opportunity exist? Absolutely. Richard, the same question to you. Well, listen, I'll agree with Jason that we have made progress as a country. I don't think that's what's in debate. I don't think that's the question of the debate. I think we, there's still, for us to be a more perfect union, we have to look at where we are and we have to figure out how do we make ourselves better. And when we know that when a black woman goes in to give birth to a baby, she's three to six times more likely to die at childbirth than her white counterpart, we have a problem. And, and, and it's a problem that is, uh, uh, it's a problem that we've got to begin to have a conversation about that, and I'm not saying I have the solution to it, but it's, we've got to begin to have, we have to begin to use the data that we have to acknowledge that we have a problem. Same goes for how, the, how this pandemic has treated communities of color. This pandemic has showed us, has laid bare very clearly, communities of color have been the bearers of this pandemic. More death has happened in black and brown communities, disproportionate to white communities. We've got to acknowledge that the problem exists so that we can do better in fixing it. If we want to, as my mom would say, break sticks and put them in our ears and act like the problem's not happening, then we will begin to revert backwards. And if you look at our, if you look at the nations around the world, right, and the nations that are beating COVID, the reason why they're beating COVID is because they're not divided. They've said, we're going to come together, we're going to figure out our problems, and we're going to unite around as a country on how we fix this. Whether you're talking about New Zealand or South Korea, all these countries that have kept their COVID numbers down, right, and they haven't had the amount of death that America's had. America's, I would argue that the reason we've seen this amount of death in America has more to do with our division and more to do with the inequities than anything else. But Richard, I'd like you to respond to Jason's point, which seemed to be that it is not that there is a dearth of opportunity for you know, any of these uh, services that were offered during the pandemic, whether it was testing or, um, well, not, not pandemic specifically, but his general argument seemed to be that it wasn't a dearth of opportunity. It was that some people were not taking advantage. What do you say to, to that? Well, I think, you have to, I think you have to have a larger conversation, right? And I think for you to begin to have that conversation, it requires you 
to understand the definition of government. And for me, I believe that the role of government is to ensure that everybody shows up. If we're having, to use a sports analogy, right? If you're having a track meet and there's eight lanes in the track meet, right? Everybody should come to the track meet with the same with the same training, and then they run the race, right? Capitalism is the race that we run. Whoever finishes first finishes first. Unfortunately, in America, some people show up to the track meet with no training and no shoes, and they're asked to run the race and they're asked to win. Other people show up to the race with the best training and the best shoes, and then we try to figure out why some people are losing and some people are winning. We're having the wrong conversation. Uh, continuing with the sports metaphor, um, there there is a question of having a equal playing field, and certainly some teams show up to the playing field with uh, different equipment, different training. I want to ask both of you um, about specifically the role of government in making certain that there is equal opportunity uh, while we're having these discussions about outcome. Um, President Biden has very clearly made equity a centerpiece of his agenda. Shortly after he took office, he said, quote, for too long, we've allowed a narrow, cramped view of the promise of this nation to fester. So my, my question that I'd like you to answer is, uh, what is the, the specific difference between equity and equality? And then what role, if any, should government be playing? And feel free to continue with the, the metaphor of the, the sports teams showing up to the field. Sure, I think when you talk about equity versus equality, I think the best setting to think about that is if you think about it in the, the setting of public education, right? Because that's the best viewing plan to look at it. So I spent a year living in, in Detroit public I spent a year living in Detroit, right? And, and oftentimes, and I said this last night and I'll say it again here, anytime that Richard Fowler and, and Governor Ron DeSantis agree on anything, you know it has to be really bad. Uh, and last week, Governor Ron DeSantis issued an executive order and a statement saying that the Florida, the Florida standardized testing, um, or I think it's, I used to be called the FCAT when I lived in Florida, I don't know what it's called now, but there's, he's, like, he's basically banned standardized testing in the state of Florida, right? And, and the use of it to judge students or even to, for, to, for even to be a test in Florida, right? And here's why he did that. Because it's not an accurate measure of how students are performing in schools. Because I was, I, and you too, I don't know, how, how old are you? <laughs> I'm 28. So then you experience the same thing I experienced, right? When we got to school, I graduated, I mean, I, I'm 34. And so we were part of this testing era where we, and many of the young people in here know what I'm talking about. We showed up to school and we spent half the year preparing to take a test. And they taught you how to take the test. We took classes on how to bubble, classes on how to do short response, classes on how to do long response. And then we took a test, and in our school, and our teachers, and our principal, and the entire school system was judged on how we bubbled, and how we did short response, and how we did long response. We didn't have any project-based instruction. We didn't learn about how to do the quadratic equation. It was all about how you performed on the test. Now, herein lies the problem with that. All of these students were judged on this same test, but not all the students were given the same resources to compete. In Detroit public schools, um, especially in 20, it was about 2015, 2016, the schools were in deplorable conditions. They were being run by the gentleman who was who's now in jail because he had poisoned people in Flint, Michigan, um, Darnell Early, for negligence. And when we went to those schools, what we found was this. And anybody who's been to Detroit knows Detroit's a very cold place. And Richard, we, I, I'm, 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 I'm getting, I'm, 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 getting to, I'm getting, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Right, and what we found was, was this. In, half, in some of these school buildings, the boiler didn't work. So some of these students had to wear winter coats as they were trying to learn their times tables. And I don't know about you, but I know if I'm cold, I can't, do much, I can't think about nothing much else but the fact that I'm being cold. So these students had no heat, and they had to learn how to do mathematics. And then, when the test, when they had to take the test, they were judging how they done the test. Now, you're telling me that these students were judged on how they performed out of test, but nobody talked about any of the externalities. The fact that they had no heat. The fact that the, school, the, school, the, 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 the bathrooms in the school didn't work. None of those things were factored in, but that school was called a failing school. So we've got to have a conversation about some of the inputs, which is what Joe Biden is talking about. If we're going to have a conversation about equity, and we're judging one group of students versus another group of students based on how they take a standardized test, we have to ask ourselves this question. Are all students being, are under the, are all students have this, do all students have the same conditions before they sit for that test? That's what equity is about ensuring that everybody has the same conditions or everybody shows up to the race, as I started with, with the same training. Then you run the race. Whoever wins the race, you get the gold medal. But if half the people don't have the right training and they show up to the race and they don't win, you can't judge them on that because they don't have the same conditions. Thank you, Richard. I well, want to give Jason yeah, a chance to respond. Um, the, the, the social justice activists are 
are worried about inequality, and I, and I think their, their, their attacks on testing are, are really barking up the wrong tree. And I, and I think if they're successful in, in uh, eliminating standardized tests, whether it's at, uh, for high schools, specialized schools, or, or the SAT, um, uh, it's going to do far more harm, harm than good. Um, uh, just in terms of background, these inequalities that we talk about um, might show up on the test, but to blame the test for them is a whole other matter. Uh, there have been studies done uh, on the number of words children hear per hour at home uh, based on family income. So a child of children on welfare uh, might hear about 600 words per hour at home. Someone from a, a working class family might hear about 1,200 words. And someone from a professional family might hear about 2,100 words, uh, more than three times as many as the child on welfare per hour at home. It might not seem like a huge difference. But what it means is that after a period of time, uh, a 10-year-old from a family on welfare will not have heard as many words as a three-year-old child of professionals. That's a gap. That's a gap that exists before the kids even start school. That gap is going to show up in life. It might show up on the high school standardized test. It might show up on the college entrance exam. It might show up when they go to apply for a job, try to join the military. It's going to show up. You get rid of that test, all you're doing is obscuring that gap. You are not erasing it, and you are not doing that child any favors. If you want to help someone, you need to know where they are because they can only get where they want to go from where they are, not from where you hope they are or want to pretend they are. You take away that test, it just makes it harder for us to know where you are and what work needs to be done to get you where you want to be. So, so we're, we're actually, we have, we have a number of questions from the audience, so we're going to keep moving. Uh, the next question here in a bit of a lightning round because we, we have a lot of room to, a lot of ground to cover, and because it's a broad topic uh, that, that both of you agreed to before we got here. I want to move on to some, you know, uh, other questions that I hope that you guys will be able to give uh, shorter, faster responses to. Um, and this is a question for Jason, which is that we have heard continuously tonight that there's talk of opportunity when it comes to the question of social justice as opposed to, to outcomes. Um, there's this conservative idea that if only individuals would take responsibility for themselves, they could be you know, masters of their own destiny. But is this idea outdated or does it need modifying in any way when, when young people, regardless of their race, uh, report that uh, it is more difficult for them to buy that first home to get by on a single income or to start a family. I guess what I'm getting at here is, are there racial disparities in social mobility that are just economic or class inequalities in disguise? Are there... Are, are there racial disparities in social mobility that are just economic or class inequalities in disguise? Well, there's lots of overlap between the two, I think, race and class, certainly. Um, but the, the question is how best to help people in that situation. And I think Richard and I would disagree in uh, whether and how much the government can help in this regard. Um, we've been down this road. The biggest help effort uh, was the Great Society programs of the 1960s. We have 50 years of experience to look back and how did it work out? We spent a ton of money. The government went all in. Financially, we went all in. How'd it go? You can compare uh, progress being made, particularly by racial and ethnic minorities prior to the Great Society programs, and the progress made after them. And draw your conclusions. And it's clear that faster progress was being made prior to these massive government interventions. In many cases, the progress didn't stop after the Great Society interventions, but it did slow significantly from where it had been. Uh, so so the, one of, one of the, the problems I have with, with turning to the government um, 
when it comes to closing these racial gaps or, or, or helping uh, racial and ethnic minorities rise um, is that, uh, you know, the greatest achievement of the civil rights movement, I was talking about uh, the King era earlier, uh, their greatest achievement, I think, was getting government off the backs of blacks, particularly in the South with respect to the Jim Crow laws. It has been when the government has tried to play a positive role that, that we've gotten in trouble. And, and, and so to, to, to reintroduce more government into the lives of struggling people, I think, risks a lot of counterpro uh, counterproductive uh, Richard, outcomes. Richard, I would like you to take up that, that, that challenge here, uh, especially in light of the fact that the current administration is planning significant uh, investments, not just in infrastructure, but also you know, what they are calling human infrastructure. Uh, take up the challenge in terms of, you know, was the great society, was that spending and those social programs, did that help minorities? And is there, are there any lessons that we can draw from that as we look to the future? Well, I think you have to, I think, there, I think there's some problems with Jason's definition. I think if you really understand the great society and the policy of the great society, it's actually the opposite. What was happening with the civil rights movement and what Thurgood Marshall and Martin Luther King wanted is they actually wanted the federal government to get involved in the South to stop Jim Crow. Think about it. After the only reason why the school, schools were actually integrated was because they, the federal government sent the National Guard down. The Civil Rights Act, or the better, better yet, the voting, let's start with the Voting Rights Act. The reason why African Americans got the right to vote in the South was because the Justice Department had, the states that had history of voter suppression had to clear their voting laws with the Justice Department, meaning the federal government got involved in how states wrote their voting laws. The Civil Rights Act is when the federal government got involved in how states created their laws. So what actually happened was the federal government got involved in how things were happening in the states that were uniquely prejudice and uniquely racist and they said you can no longer do this and we as the federal government will get in the way and make sure you don't do it. That's what actually happened in the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement is when the government got involved and said we will no longer allow you to segregate against a group of individuals based on the color of their skin. Right? The ideal or the, the, ideal and the notion that the civil rights movement was we're going to get the government out the way. What actually happened, the government was out the way a hundred, well the government got out the way after Reconstruction. Because after Reconstruction, when the South was given the ability to do whatever the hell they wanted to do, what actually happened was there was a hundred years of Jim Crow, where there was lynchings and people weren't given the right to vote and schools were segregated and African Americans were killed for walking on the wrong side of the street or drinking out the wrong water fountain or going through the wrong door or sitting on the wrong bus seat. That's what was actually happening. So the federal government actually got involved and said we will no longer allow racial practices or racist practices or segregation in the South. So when we have a conversation about how we're going to ensure that we create more seats at the table, or what Joe Biden is talking about when he talks about human infrastructure to Jason's point, and Jason is right, it is true that if you are somebody who, or you're from a working class, or you might, if you are somebody who's on a TANF program or you're on welfare, you're getting less words you're getting less words than somebody who might be pro from the professional class. And so what human infrastructure says is, is this. If you can't afford to send your kid to early childhood education because it's too much, and let's be very clear, anybody who has little kids know that sending your kid to preschool can cost as much as a mortgage in some places, $2,000 a month to send your kid to preschool. What happens if you work at Walmart and you can't afford that? The government says we're going to step in and we're going to give your child the ability to compete against those folks from the professional class. That's what, and that's what the job of government should be. To go back to my analogy at the beginning, if we really want to compete against our global partners, if we really want to take on China and India and, and South Korea in this next era that we're up against, understand how much money they're spending educating their young people, how much money they're spending closing the gap. We've got to be doing and spending the same amount of money to ensure that we're closing the gap or we're going to get beat by our competitors internationally, period. Jason, would you like to I, very quickly? I just <laughs> failed to grasp the logic of Richard's argument, which is that the government is failing the underclass. What's the solution? More government. Um, I like to look at what was going on uh, in terms of black progress in this country 
before the government gave a damn what was happening to black people. Because that rate of progress has never been matched by any great society program put together in the 1960s. Between 1940 and 1960, black poverty in this country fell by 40 percentage points. It's before Voting Rights Act, before Civil Rights Act, at a time when you could put a, a sign in a window that said, we don't hire blacks. And it was perfectly legal because government laws made it legal. State government laws made it legal. Yes, state government laws made it legal. There's a big distinction. Um, Yet, this, this, this tremendous progress was being made. Economists that have looked at the decades when blacks made the greatest amount of progress economically in this country was the post-war period beginning in the late 40s up until about 1970, before the Great Society programs took effect. So again, I think government trying to help well-intentioned government programs, well-intentioned politicians, have often gotten in the way of black progress. And often, and the reason I think they've gotten in the way um, is because they've interfered with the sort of self-development that needs to take place for a group to rise. Internal development that needs to take place. Uh, I, I'd like to get to some of our audience questions. Again, uh, feel free to send in questions. Uh, our first question is you know, straight, to, uh, straight to the point. The questioner asks, what do you believe is the best policy for eliminating racism in America today? And to make this slightly more topical um, and you know, more focused, uh, at the beginning of the Biden administration, Texas Democratic Representative Sheila Jackson Lee said, the government sanctioned slavery, and that is what we need, a reckoning, a healthy reparative justice. Shortly afterwards, the president established a commission to study the possibility of reparations. Um, would reparations right past wrongs, or would they make things worse? And, and please respond to the, the questioner who asks if there's one best policy for eliminating racism in America. We'll start with you, Jason. Um, I don't believe racism will be eliminated in America, or sexism, or homophobia, uh, or anti-Semitism. Um, I, I, I just have a more tragic view of human nature, I guess. I think the best thing we can do is to try and minimize the effects of these things. And when it comes to racism, I think free market capitalism does the best to minimize the effects because it puts a price on discriminating against people. And many of the government interventions uh, put in place in the name of helping um, lower the price of discrimination. And so, I, I, you know, I, I guess I would reject the, the premise of, of, of the question. As regards uh, reparations, no. Um, I, broadly speaking, and this gets back to the discussion of the Great Society, all reparations would be is another huge government wealth transfer program. Again, we've tried this before. If simply sending poor people checks ended poverty, we would have ended poverty a long time ago. We've Richard. been doing this for decades. So, so a couple of things. Where I do agree with Jason is I think that you have, I, I think it's a, hard, it's a hard question. I don't think we'll ever eliminate individual racism in America, and I don't think that should be our pursuit. Our pursuit is about how we ensure that the systems of America don't have racism in them, right? And, and I think to do that, it requires that we begin to understand how we got here, because this ideal of wealth transfer, he, Jason's right, it's not a new idea. But to say that it's failed, that's wrong. Because think about it, the GI Bill, the great GI Bill after World War II, created a generation of wealth for a certain group of people. Now, African Americans were not included in the GI Bill, so they didn't get this That's money. That's not true. Well, I, 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 I have black relatives who went to me, college excuse on me, the GI Bill. Excuse me, excuse me. For ex let's use an example. Of the 3,229 GI Bill recipients in the state of Mississippi, who got, and this is right after World War II, who got money for houses, businesses, farms, and other things, only two of them were African American in the 1940s and 50s. So think about this, and we all know that one of the greatest ways to transfer wealth in America is through home ownership, right? So if 
3,227 individuals who got the GI Bill were Caucasian after World War II, and they were able to open businesses, they were able to get farm loans, they were able to buy homes. And only two black people were able to take advantage of those same opportunities. Not because they weren't afforded the money from the GI Bill, but they were banks that wouldn't give them loans, right? So they went and said, hey, I just came back from World War II, can I get a loan? The bank says, no, we're not going to give you a loan. Or banks said, no, you live in a neighborhood where you can't develop there because of redlining and various other things. So we have to hack after ourselves this question. America has been doing wealth transfers for a very long time. Wealth transfers aren't new in this country. Wealth transfers was how we created the state of Oregon, how we created the state of Washington, how we created California, land leases. This is nothing new. This is how we created wealth in this country. Sadly, certain groups were excluded from that wealth transfer. So what we're asking for here is how do, if this happened in the past, how do we correct the wrongs? Because we know that building wealth doesn't happen overnight. And America's biggest flaw, and this has nothing to do with race, is this. When we create a law, whether we create the Civil Rights Act in 65, we're like, oh, we created the law, we fixed the problem, we move on. We never go back and say, well, did this law work? Should we go back and tinker with it? Maybe we can make it a little better? Right? And this has everything to do with the fact that we live in a two-party system where once one party has the ball, they run down the field as fast as possible, they'll knock over any defender, and we refuse to have a conversation with the other side saying, wait, wait a minute, did this work? Did it not work? Can Richard, we make it better? Richard, Can we make it worse? In all work? fairness here, I mean, Jason did mention the legislation that created the Great Society several times throughout tonight's discussion and was asking for an evaluation of whether or not that did create the desired outcomes. So there doesn't there seem to be some some, you know, uh, rich, you know, thought about how the, the how legislation has worked in the yeah, past. Yeah, well, the I Great mean, Society was what LBJ was trying to do was help minorities play catch up. It was a hundred years where minorities were be after slavery. There was ten years of Reconstruction. In that ten years of Reconstruction. Black folks started to make achievements. Black folks were elected to the Senate. They were elected to the House. And every time African Americans made steps forward, I give you Tulsa, Oklahoma, there were, they burned it down. So what LBJ was trying to do was like, well, I'm going to try to level the playing field. But understand, there were 100 years where there was no leveling happening. <laughs> so what, he was try what LBJ was attempting to do, based on his lived experience, because remember, LBJ was an elementary school teacher to, in, in, in second grade to Latinx folks in Texas, and he says, we've got to figure out a way to make sure that we can le level the playing field. So he put laws in place to help level the playing field. Those laws existed for about 10 years before they were, most of them were ripped off the ground by Richard Nixon. So there was 10 years for these laws to work, and slowly but surely they were ripped away. In that time period, LBJ eliminated childhood hunger in that time period, LBJ funded public schools in black and brown neighborhoods. And then slowly but surely, these things were rolled back and turned into state block grants and various other things. So when we have a conversation of whether or not LBJ's Great Society worked, we have to have a conversation about the starting point at which he created those policies. Mm -hmm. And how was there 100 years for those policies to actually work or not? OK, Jason. Uh, well, I, I just have to start by correcting false statements. First, starting with the fact that the GI Bill excluded blacks. Were they able to go to the bank and get a loan on the GI Bill? It depended on where you lived. Exactly. And in racist Depending states. Depending on where you lived. Richard, please. And in Jason racist southern here. states. They, they couldn't take advantage of it. <laughs> in racist southern states, they did discriminate. Again, under government laws in those states. Now, he also said that LBJ ended child poverty. Child I poverty. Said I said child hunger. Ch child hunger. I'm excuse me. Child hunger. He almost eliminated it. Child hunger and child poverty. I did not say child were, poverty. Were both falling at faster rates prior to the Great Society policy interventions than they were in subsequent years. He said that after LBJ, these programs were rolled back. Richard Nixon expanded the Great Society programs. He didn't roll them back. He doubled down on them. Again, I'm sorry, but, but I don't know where you're getting this. Well, this the, were they, we're, we're going to have to leave it there and go were back. Were they not to, turned into state block grants? We're going to go to an uh, audience question here. Uh, an audience member asks, and this is relevant to what you brought up about wealth transfer moments ago, an audience member asks, 
what is just about forcing me, especially if I had made responsible decisions, to pay for other individuals' irresponsible decisions? So I, I don't, is, is that for me? Yeah. Well, I, listen, let's be very clear. America is already transferring wealth to corporations, right? So it's already happening. Wealth transfers happen every day. When Amazon decides to build a factory wherever Jeff Bezos wants to build it, governments and states and federal governments give them tax abatements and they give them lower tax rates to do it. It happens every day. <laughs> so the idea that the American taxpayer is like their money is going to fund other things and help other people out. Corporate welfare is a thing and corporate welfare happens every day. That's why companies like IBM and Apple, their tax bill is zero dollars and zero cents. So if we're having a conversation about responsible Americans paying their tax and it's going for companies, for people doing irresponsible things, I point you to all the Fortune 500 companies. So, R Richard, is it your thought though that it would be possible to pay for these expansions and programs without taxing individuals and just taxing these corporations that you I'm, mentioned? I, listen, I, I'm not against that, right? I'm not against, I, I think there's other, I, and I'm not saying that you have to raise taxes on, uh, on middle-class families to do it. I, I'm, I'm saying there's, there's definitely money out here to do it. If Jeff Bezos, for example, uh, and, and, and Jeff Bezos is building a new a HQ2 in Arlington, Virginia. He got $150 million in tax abatements to do it. And that money should be going to building schools, building roads, building hospitals. Instead, it's going to Jeff Bezos, who just spent a billion dollars going to space for 10 minutes. Now, where is that money more accurately spent? Giving it to billionaire Jeff Bezos or actually investing in our communities? That's the question that we should be asking ourselves. Jason, would you like to respond? <laughs> I, I don't support corporate welfare. Oh, so <laughs> I, but my 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 uh, solution wouldn't be to uh, exacerbate things by extending it to the rest of, of society. It would be to roll back corporate welfare on principle. I'm okay with that. Well, that's and not I'm what, not that's saying, not what you're not, arguing for. No, no, no. What I'm not saying is, yeah, but you're like, I mean, I think when people, when I think the notion of this ideal of massive uh, of massive giveaways that's not what i'm saying here i'm saying are there things that we could be doing better is there other wiser investments that we could be making as a nation than giving jeff bezos 150 well, million dollars okay. and the okay. answer to that question is yes the answer to that question is if we're trying to compete against south korea and india and china we can't compete against them if america's young people are graduating college with 1.5 trillion dollars of student loan debt shackled to their legs and this has nothing to do with race this has everything to do with where are our priorities if a Chinese adult or millennial is graduating college PhD level with zero debt and an American student is graduating with a PhD in nuclear physics with a half a million dollars of debt, how are we competing against our global partners? I, I, I would push back against uh, this idea that, that we can solve America's problems by taxing wealthier people at higher rates. I didn't say wealthier people. Well, you, <laughs> you keep Platt. talking about Jeff Bezos. And I his said billions, corporations. <laughs> but you just said he spent a billion dollars. Well, his, co his Richard, corporation like spent a billion answer, dollars. We've got more two, questions two, that I want to get to, two, two. Jason. If you, you but, the floor but is yours. yeah, I, I think that um, uh, I don't think there are enough rich people uh, in America to finance the government spending that 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 Richard is calling for. I just don't think the math the math works, let alone the incentives or the disincentives put in place when you um, start uh, confiscatory tax rates for our most productive citizens. Um, I, I think you're creating all kinds of dis disincentives that will resonate uh, throughout the economy. But, but on a more fundamental level, the math just doesn't work. There aren't enough billionaires to finance the type of government spending he's talking about. Uh, we've got, so, a, question so from our, we've got a question from our audience for, for Jason, and you'll get a chance to respond, of course. This is fundamental. Um, it's, a, it's a question from our member who says, if so many of the issues relating to racial bias relate to economic disparities, how can we say that free market capitalism is the answer to the problems? Wouldn't it be better to create a more equitable system rather than a system which encourages the hoarding of wealth that could help a race who has had the upper hand for over a century? Again, the question is always, what is your alternative to capitalism and whether that alternative is a better system? And if someone has a better system for lifting uh, people out of poverty and creating opportunity, I've never seen it. Uh, capitalism uh, has, 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 has run circles around these other systems in terms of doing that. 
um, both here in America and wherever else it's been tried. So um, the, the question is not that whether capitalism is perfect or has all the answers. It is what is your alternative to capitalism? And we have seen uh, more socialist societies try and spread the wealth, and they end up spreading the poverty. And, and that is not something I want to see happen in America. So a couple of things. I think first, I, I want to. I, I reject this notion that only millionaires and billionaires are productive, um, because I think that's wrong. I think if you I didn't had, say that. You said the most productive. The most productive. Well, I beg that to doesn't mean I no beg one to, else is productive. I, well, I beg to differ on this on this frame of the. I reject the frame of the most productive because I'll tell you this: a kindergarten teacher is very productive, and I think they're most productive. I think a nurse is most productive. I think a coal miner, they're most productive, and I think the fact that a coal miner is paying more in taxes, right? If you look at tax rates, then Mitt Romney and his, in his, his, his elevator for his horses, that's problematic. They're not paying more in taxes. If Mitt Romney's effective tax rate is 14%. There's a difference between tax Effective rates tax rate. And how much you pay. Of course, we're talking about effective tax rate. If a teacher's effective tax rate, mind you, a teacher only draws her income potentially from her W-2 form is 25 to 35 percent. And Mitt Romney and his dressage horses and his elevator, his effective tax rate is 14 percent. That's problematic, and I'm not the only person that feels that way. Because a lot of millionaires and billionaires feel the same way. And they're the ones saying, Michael Bloomberg, for example, is the one saying, we've got to figure out a way to balance the system. The fact that he, he said it himself, the fact that I pay less percentage-wise than my secretary is problematic. The fact that I can afford a good accountant, and so thus I can write off my tax bill, and my, and my secretary cannot, shows the inequities in our system. And this is not, this has nothing to do with race. This is the, how our tax code is written. Our tax code is written to benefit those who can lobby the Congress. This is my problem with how Washington is having the conversation. Why? Because millionaires and billionaires can afford to send people to Washington to advocate on their behalf. Unfortunately, those of us in this audience, we can't afford to do that. So when they write the tax laws, they're written to benefit those, and I'll give you a great example. In Trump's tax bill, right, the middle class tax cut, while yes, it's in there, the middle class tax cut is temporary. It sunsets in about what we have, it was written, so we have what, seven years left on it, and it'll be sunsetted. But the, the tax cut for the millionaires and the billionaires is permanent. They were able to send lobbyists down to ensure that their tax cut were permanent, but ours, our sunsets, and we have to pray, and we have to hope, and we have to go to the, we have to have every priest and every prayer warrior that we know pray that Congress will make our tax cut permanent or our tax rate will increase while Mitt Romney and his elevator and his horses continue to benefit off of a tax plan written by them and their lobbyists. This is, when I started this conversation, I said to you guys, the problem here, and ladies, is that we don't have enough seats at the table. And if the middle class is not at the table having a conversation about what works for us, and millionaires and billionaires have the ability to walk into congressional offices and say, hey, we want this to be in the tax code. We want that to be in the tax code. And it's literally written in the tax code as they say it. We should all be upset. It doesn't matter what party you belong to. It doesn't matter what race you are. It doesn't matter your economic standings. When one person has able to go in and get what they want from their elected official, and some of us are not, we should be angry angry, we should be appalled, and we should be upset because that's not the definition of a republic, and that's not the definition of a representative government. You, co you covered a lot of ground there in terms of representation and also corporate interests. Jason, would you like to respond? I didn't, I didn't catch the first part. Uh, of you, so Richard covered quite a bit of ground there. Is there anything that stuck out to you that you would like well, to respond? I, I, I think we're sort of talking past one another. If he's arguing for higher tax rates. I'm not. Um, <laughs> Richard, if you could let Jason uh, respond. For corporations or for individuals, um, I would just like to see how his math works in terms of raising government revenue. Um, uh, when he says that private citizens shouldn't be able to lobby their government, um, uh, I don't know if he you know, thinks that some citizens are more deserving of lobbies than others. The last time I looked, the labor unions are a pretty powerful lobby. They have a seat at the table in Washington, a big seat at the table in Washington. Um, trial lawyers, pretty big lobby. They have a big seat at the table, too. Um, you know, Left-wing interest groups have a seat at the table. Right-wing interest groups have a seat at the table. That's the way our government works. Um, I don't 
I think it's part of free speech, lobbying your government. Um, but, you know, if that's, I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to put words in his mouth if he's calling for the end of lobbying your government. Uh, is that what you're talking about? That's not what I said at all. What, I, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm very clearly saying is when some people are able to have more of the ear, ear of an elected official and allows them to make it, it's in the law. I don't have to make it up. The who, Trump who I mean, has more sway than teachers unions? Well, listen, if the teachers unions were so effective, then they would have maybe then the, the, the middle class tax would have been permanent, but it's not. <laughs> I mean, the proof is in the pudding. I, Do I you know to, how much money I'm went asking, to teachers I'm, unions I'm, in I'm, the COVID I'm, relief bill? I'm asking, I'm, the, well, to be very clear. The money that was in the COVID relief bill that went to public education went to a couple of things. A lot of that money went directly to public schools to ensure that they updated their ventilation because as we all know, most of the public schools that our young people go because to- Because teachers unions lobbied me. for it. Uh, excuse me. Most of the money, most of the public schools that our young people go to were built in the 1940s and the 1950s. Many of these public school systems and many of these air conditioned, these HVAC units were built in the 1940s and the 1950s. That money went to update those ventilation systems. And if, I don't know about you, I don't have any kids, but I have a lot of nieces, I have a lot of cousins who are small, and I want them to breathe the best air that they can breathe, especially in an era where we know that this disease spreads, but spreads by so, air droplets. So your lobbyists are on the side of the angels. No, that's not what I'm, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> they're, in, they're, they're just trying to make that's sure your I'm kids, that's our not kids can breathe. That's not what I'm saying at all, but my point, the point I'm trying to make here is, if we're having a conversation, we're having a conversation about taxation, and if we're having a conversation about taxation, I believe that the tax, if, if we're talking about how we're going to, if we're talking about lowering taxes, then we should lower taxes for the Americans that work the hardest. And the last time I checked, the Americans that work the hardest in this country are working families and middle class families. And the fact that their marginal tax rate is higher than Jeff Bezos and Michael Bloomberg and Mitt Romney and the millionaires and billionaires of this country, to me, that's problematic. I can't speak for you, but I'll speak for me and I'll say that's problematic. I'd like to leave time for both of you to make your closing statements, but um, your comments about uh, HVAC in schools sort of brings us around um, to, I think, a, a final question here, which is that at the forefront of a lot of discussions about social justice has been about education and has been about um, you know, how we teach that story about ourselves. Uh, we have seen over the summer um, significant frustration and then significant support for uh, critical race theory taught in schools, anti-racism curriculum taught in schools. Uh, my question, and we'll start with Jason on this one, is uh, are Republicans correct when they say that this is a racialized education that is counterproductive, or are their critics um, correct when they say that this is just about giving an accurate uh, assessment of U.S. history? I think that, um, A, it's not accurate. Um, to say that the country uh, uh, was founded on slavery or that is uh, at the center of our founding is, is not accurate. I think that's a rewriting of U.S. history. Um, to say that slavery makes America uh, uniquely evil is not accurate. Slavery existed uh, long before America did in existed all over the world, it still exists in places like Nigeria and Sudan as we speak. Um, what makes America unique is not slavery, it's emancipation. That is what has been the rarity in the world. Um, uh, but, the, but my second problem with teaching this to our children, uh, this critical race theory, um, America has become increasingly pluralistic. Uh, the fastest growing racial and ethnic groups are Asians and Hispanics. The idea that we would teach our children, kindergartners, first graders, to obsess over skin color is, is outrageous. It's disastrous. How, how can this end anyway but in a disaster? To teach young children to focus on their racial differences? in an increasingly pluralistic society? Do we not know how badly this could end? So it's twofold that my issue is. It's, it's, it's an ahistorical 
uh, 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 reading of, of, of America's founding. And um, uh, I think it does far more to divide us than to unite us. You know, people talk about America's diversity being our strength. Our strength isn't our diversity. Our strength has been our ability uh, to overcome our racial differences and focus on what unites us. That has been America's strength. And to focus on our diversity, on our differences, to me is not, not the way forward. Richard. And, so, then we'll, and then we'll go to uh, closing remarks. For sure. So, so I, I would agree with Jason if critical race was actually being taught in our classrooms. But the reality is, is that if you truly understand, so critical race theory has become a, a catch-all and a net for things that aren't happening in our classrooms, right? Talk to the educators that you know in your life and ask them, are they actually teaching what Crenshaw, who's the author of Critical Race Theory, and Dr. Bell, the author of Critical Race Theory, a very complex theory that, to be honest with you, the first time I encountered Critical Race Theory was my senior year of college, was the, when I was able to understand it, because it requires you to understand the complex understanding of systems, which a kindergartner can barely understand. So, put that on the shelf for just a second, and let's talk about what is happening in our classrooms, right? What educators are asking for, and what, they, what, they, what they're asking for is, how do we teach truth, how do we talk about the, true, the truth of American history? And let's be real, American history is beautiful, but American history is also bitter, bittersweet. American history includes 400 years of slavery, and another 100 years of racial oppression after that. American history includes a trail of tears, where we moved Indians off their land and make them, made them walk from Florida and Georgia to Oklahoma. Just imagine walking from Florida to Oklahoma, right? American history includes Japanese internment camps. American history has some black eyes in it. It's the truth. And, and uh, for order for us to be a good, a strong and good country, it requires us to teach our young people that America's history isn't lollipops, roses, and apples. There was some rotten apples in the bunch, right? There was a civil war. There we, we had some bad actors. And, and I think the best way to understand this is to look at Germany. Because Germany is a great example of how it was done. The 68ers in Germany did something really special. So after Hitler was, after Hitler fell, there was a group of people in Germany that said, not only are we going to ban Nazi symbols, but we're going to commemorate the six million Jews that were lost, and we're going to teach our young people about anti-Semitism. And if you notice when you go to Germany, there's no kids going to Adolf Hitler High School, or there's no Adolf Hitler Airport. But in America, our kids go to Robert E. Lee High School, and we commemorate the Civil War and the, and the South as if they weren't traitors and treasonous that decided to part ways with the United States of America. So we've got to begin to tell our young people the truth that America's history, while beautiful, was also bittersweet. So I agree with Jason. If we were teaching critical race theory in our schools, I would be out there protesting too. But what I want in our schools is for our young people to understand the truth. Because if you understand the truth about not only America's history, but the Western Hemisphere's history, then you would understand why there are 10,000 Haitians at our southern border. Can I ask a question? Sure. What child in America today is going to school and not learning about slavery, the Trail of Tears, and Japanese and So Americans? I'll give you a great example. In the standard learning exam in Virginia, <laughs> right, there was a question that said, where do the we, people, they were brought over here as indentured servants. No, they were brought over here as enslaved That's people. That's not true. They were that brought over as indentured servants. They were brought over here as enslaved people. There's a big distinction. No, the indentured <laughs> servitude. <laughs> they were brought over in No, servitude. indentured servitude allows you to, buy, to work your freedom. You work yes. towards your freedom. The slaves did not work towards their freedom. They were enslaved for generations and generations. That's what they were enslaved for 400 whoa, years. Whoa, whoa. No, no. That, okay. your, your history, your history is. I mean, I don't know about you, but the, I mean, the I mean, first I mean, Africans brought to this country the one, were Richard, brought here well, as indentured servants. Fair, and then the ones Gentlemen after that, fair. there wouldn't right. be there wouldn't be an Gentlemen. underground what? railroad. You, you, but you haven't answered my question. Tugman you haven't answered my Frederick question. Douglas, what child in America today is not learning about slavery, 
the trail of we, tears and Japanese internment The fights camps. that we're having in this country, and be, they're literally, they're literal, the literal fights that we're having in this country, they were textbook, they were literally textbooks in Texas that we treated slaves nicely. I mean, I, I mean I'm not making what this up. What child today is not learning about these things? I'm not making this up. Listen, you could quote teachers. Teachers are telling you, this is a quote from a teacher that was, they were, this is a teacher who gave an interview to Chalkbeat, and they said, many of the laws created today what makes it impossible for us to teach about the Trail of Tears, the Civil Rights Movement, and, and the Civil War. An English teacher said, right, the, te the, current, the current laws that are being written allow it makes it impossible for me to teach about things like James Baldwin, a quote that you started with. What, Lines wait, wait, what laws? Right, well, we're talking about the eight laws that were passed by states all across the country. None of those laws actually include critical race theory in the law itself. The laws are, the bills are very vague. They don't have any enforcement. So when we're having a conversation about critical race theory, Jason, I would be with you. I would be outraged if they were teaching critical race theory in our classrooms. But when you see these bills that are being passed by state legislators and you take the time to read the bill, the bill doesn't even mention the word critical race theory and it ban and it makes it impossible for educators to teach the accuracy of what actually happened. You, you seem to be suggesting that the 1619 project is filling a void that kids aren't learning about slavery and Japanese internment camps and the Trail of Tears and we need something like the critical race theory to fill this void. No, I Richard, please give me I think or, Jason or, or the 1619 project how, to fill this void. About the 1619 project. I didn't even bring it up. You brought it up. Richard, what? I, I, I guess we're just talking in circles here because I, you, did you learn about the Trail of Tears and Japanese internment camps and slavery? I, I will say this. As an African-American man, I, my mother went out of her way to teach me about slave rebellions. And about you Nat didn't learn about it in school? I didn't learn about Nat Turner in school. Did you learn about slavery I learn and about Japanese slave internment rebellions. camps? I did not learn about There's a lot of things. And the Trail of Tears. There's a lot. I learned a very brushed over history in school, but because my mom took the time out to teach me certain things, I had a better information, more informed education about what actually happened to people of color in America. Unfortunately, I think we're going to have to leave it there. We're going to move on to our final statements. Uh, to our audience, again, you have an opportunity to vote on the motion that was before us at the beginning. Richard, the, uh, the floor is yours for your, your closing remarks. Thank you. Look, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, I really appreciated this dialogue. I want to thank Jason. Uh, this is our night two. We spent two days together. Uh, I want to thank the Steamboat Institute for having us, as well as this amazing university and President Marshall for hosting us. And I want to go back to where I started this conversation. Listen, I will tell you this. There's, we can disagree on all of the issues. But what I urge folks to do is this. When you hear somebody disagree with you on the issues, take pretense and prejudgment out of it and ask, I wonder why they feel that way. Why is it that you come to that conclusion? And engage them in the conversation. Now, like I said at the beginning, these conversations won't be easy, they won't be nice, they won't be tough, they won't be, they won't be nice, they won't be easy, they'll be very tough. But if we can have these tough conversations with each other, we can truly make this country better. And let me tell you something, I live in Washington, D.C., and I'm telling you, the conversations aren't happening there. What's happening in Washington, D.C., whether the Democrats are in control or whether the Republicans are in control, is as soon as they are given the gavel, they're given the control, they take the ball and they run as, far, as fast as possible down the field, they knock their opponents out the way and they refuse to have a conversation. And if we don't begin to have a conversation with each other, what's going to end up happening is every four years the policies are going to shift and the policies are going to shift. And what's going to happen to all of us is we're just going to have a bad case of whiplash. So it's on us. It's on you, it's on me, it's on us to figure out how we make this country better. And then we demand that our legislators do what we send them to Washington to do. Pass policies that improve the lives of everyday Americans who go to work from nine to five to make their family proud, to make their community better, and to make their kids' life a little bit better than their own. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Jason, the floor is yours. Uh, sure, just very, very quickly. Um, I do want to thank the, the Steamboat Institute and the, and the two of you for, for joining me up here this evening. Um, uh, I think it's very important for uh, 
for students on college campuses to hear different points of view um, on issues of the day. And I think it's become a real problem on, on college campuses lately where, where students are, are, are supposed to be learning about different ways to approach public policy, uh, how to sharpen their critical thinking skills, understanding that when you disagree with someone, you don't disinvite them, you don't try and silence them, you don't try and smear their character, you debate them. Uh, and that's not happening um, on, on enough campuses today. Uh, I think students are, are, with the indulgence often of the administration, are being taught um, uh, what to think instead of, instead of how to think. Um, uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful that the Steamboat Institute is pushing back against uh, these trends, and, and I'm glad that um, all of you decided to, to join us this evening. So thank you. That concludes the debate portion of the evening, but uh, you are the audience. You get a chance to weigh in on the initial motion. I have those results. Again, the motion that we started uh, this uh, evening with, we've covered, once again, uh, a lot of material. But uh, the motion was, do you think the social justice movement is the new civil rights movement? To start, 46% said yes. 37% said no. 17% were unsure. That was the starting point. At the end, 45% say yes, 43% say no, and 12% are unsure. Thank you so much. Uh, I will leave you to interpret those results. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. Just very briefly, thank you to Jason Riley, Richard Fowler, and Philip Wegman for a very compelling discussion tonight, gentlemen. Thank you again. Can we have another round of applause for our panelists? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To all of our audience members, both in person and watching online, this video will be available on Steamboat Institute's YouTube channel and our Facebook page. You can always go to steamboatinstitute.org to find that link. Please share this with others. We, we want thousands of people to see this very robust quality discussion we had tonight. Finally, thanks again to President Marshall and the CMU Civic Forum for hosting us here on the Colorado Mesa University campus in beautiful Grand Junction. Please remember to visit steamboatinstitute.org. Follow us on social media. Your financial support is what allows us to bring these debates to campuses throughout Colorado and around America. Thank you again so much to all of you for joining us this evening and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.